Good morning, everyone, and good evening to those of you who are joining us across the Atlantic or in some other time zone around this glorious globe of ours. Uh, my name is Shamsher Burke. I'm the executive director at Zero One, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this culminating event of Impact Art Austria, um, the end of a one month long exchange um, that I'll say more about in a moment. But before I do, um, I wanna take a minute to acknowledge the land that I am on um, and Zero One finds itself on. The uh, Zero One headquarters in the Grand Theater in San Francisco are on the unceded uh, Ramatush Ohlone territory um, in California that of course is settled land. And I think in the context of this event, um, I wanna suggest and encourage all of you to hold in mind that we are, we are through this exchange, um, bringing together cultures from the, the old word, world, so to speak, um, of Europe and, and the new world or the settled space of, of uh, the United States. Um, and to keep that in mind as we're talking about culture and, and language and truth making um, across distance. So um, to say a few words about Zero One as an organization, um, our mission is to leverage art, science and technology for social change. And we do that work um, through three program areas um, using socially engaged media art um, in exchange, such as this, um, in arts education, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning, and also in public art, um, artwork in public space. Um, exchange, of course, though, of that trifecta is really close to our heart. Um, and we really do feel that that is something that um, finds its way into all of our programming. Some sort of communication across difference where we come together to co-create and learn from each other. Um, this exchange itself, Impact Art Austria, has been a labor of love for several years now. Um, I really want to offer heartfelt thanks to all of the partners who've helped to make this happen, um, especially Open Austria here in San Francisco, um, essentially the arm of the Austrian government here in our fair city, uh, Clara Bloom and Martin Rauchbauer, um, you know, got together with me now well over two years ago and started dreaming up a way to connect Austria and San Francisco more meaningfully um, in, in creative ways. Um, and that first birthed an exchange which was called uh, American Arts Incubator Austria. Uh, you'll hear maybe a little more about that as well later, where we sent an American artist, Rashin Bahandesh, who happens to be with us today, um, abroad to Linz in Austria to run a very similar style of exchange to this. And in this case, in this case we're inviting an Austrian artist, uh, Patricia Reis, um, to, to lead an exchange here in a virtual exchange here in the Bay Area. So big thanks to Open Austria. I also want to thank uh, Ars Electronica, who is our partner in Austria, um, Gefried Stocker, um, Veronica Liebel, Veronica Kren, um, all really worked hard to make this exchange and the, the ongoing conversation between Austria and the United States possible. Um, and then of course, a huge thank you to the Austrian Ministry for Art, Culture, Civil Service and Sport, and specifically to uh, Olga Okunev there um, in the ministry who has carried the torch for us um, and made the funding for this exchange possible. Um, through many machinations and shifts in, uh, in the Austrian government that have taken place in the last couple of years. So thank you for your enduring support. Um, so you get a sense even just from that list of partners who has come together to make this possible and that this exchange really is in a lineage of exchanges um, that we hope to, to grow into the future, continuing the conversation between Austria and the United States and specifically the Bay Area. Um, so the way we did this is that we brought together the partners I just mentioned and selected a jury um, who represented each of those partners or essentially were nominated by each of those partners. We had Ruth Schnell with us, a well-regarded media artist from Austria, um, Gefried Stocker, the, the artistic director at Ars Electronica, and Vanessa Chang, who's also with us today in, the, in a moment. Um, and they, the three of them uh, reviewed applications from Austrian artists who applied to lead the exchange 
and selected the one and only Patricia Reis. Um, Patricia, you're welcome to join me on screen um, at this point. Uh, you know, selecting Patricia was an obvious choice in many ways um, because of her embedded uh, feminist hacking practice, um, being so deeply rooted in a community in Vienna as a Portuguese transplant um, that, that we felt resonated strongly with the Bay Area and the cultural community here. Um, and that, that her work really um, you know, dives into the sensory, the sensual, um, and, and she produces these embodied works that make physical uh, the philosophical. So I, I really um, was thrilled that the jury landed on Patricia uh, as the lead artist for this exchange in search of truth. Um, so welcome, Patricia. Um, so a couple of words before um, Patricia gives us a little more context about the exchange. Um, this is essentially a work in progress showing. We are going to share with you momentarily um, the virtual exhibition for In Search of Truth. Uh, this is a launch of that virtual exhibition, and it is also a sharing of work that has been developed in a very brief creative sprint. Um, so the artists who've been involved in the exchange went through workshop activity with Patricia. They then dove into um, a development project development phase where they made these works over the last two weeks approximately. Um, and that the point of today's event really is for them to show this work in its raw state and to get feedback from uh, a series of panelists who I'll introduce, introduce in a moment as well after Patricia speaks. So these are prototypes. They're raw, they're vulnerable, um, and I would encourage the panelists, encourage the public watching to really take them in in that light and to offer your thoughts and your questions um, that might guide these artists as they continue to develop their work and their thinking about these, these particular projects. Um, so with that, Patricia, if you'd like to, to take over and, and say a little more about um, what we're about to see and, and what your experience has been over the past month. Thank you so much, Samshir. I'm really happy to be here and excited at the same time. I mean, also sad, I have to say, because um, it felt it was so intense these past weeks, but at the same time, so short. And um, maybe it would be also interesting to say that uh, uh, there's a huge distance, right? And um, in um, a physical geographic distance between us and uh, I feel um, this um, also mixed feeling in a way that uh, I'm so close. I'm constantly in San Francisco, almost every day connected, uh, but at the same time, I'm not there physically. So it's a, it's a very interesting um, uh, feeling, especially when, when it comes to the very uh, complex topic of our um, program, uh, the search of truth. So yeah, today I also want to uh, maybe underline the fact uh, or maybe just uh, that is um, clear for everybody that the projects are working in progress, but at the same time, uh, some of them are very close to, um, uh, to um, the final intent, let's say format. And I was really surprised uh, because these amazing participants that are here today with us were able to uh, actually materialize so much in such um, a small amount of time. So the program has a sham share um, mentioned already. We had very intensive uh, workshop sessions where we uh, had the opportunity to discuss a lot of um, issues related uh, with the main topic but also at the same time, we try to embrace everybody's practice and inputs when it comes to um, this um, um, complexity of uh, finding the, the truth, which we concluded in a way that there's not obviously one truth, but many different uh, perspectives towards what could be cons uh, um, cons considered, let's say, the, uh, the answer to our questions. And, um, and these sessions were pretty much practice on one hand, but also very, um, so very uh, theoretical also on the other hand. And we were uh, also, uh, because we are a small group, we had the opportunity 
to somehow come together and constantly exchange and help each other. And it was so interesting to see even that when it comes to sharing tools and uh, technical knowledge, uh, the participants were connecting to each other, even obviously after this time um, of the workshops. So I'm not sure if you mentioned, um, maybe we should underline also the, that we have at the moment, we just launched a virtual exhibition, uh, which is uh, now on the domain truth.01.org slash index.html. And uh, in this exhibition, uh, we can somehow have a little bit of um, uh, a small uh, sample slash showcase of what we have been working on during these past weeks. So I would maybe just, um, if I have the chance, um, read a little bit of my uh, curatorial statement of this exhibition, uh, so I can um, maybe share better my, uh, our collective thoughts on the main topic in, in search of truth. So um, this virtual exhibition, um, it um, was for us, uh, for sure, a kind of a challenge to put together a document, uh, especially at a distance, all these uh, different ideas. And it's definitely um, the result of like this intensive collaboration, which I, I believe it in my point of view, it was definitely a challenge to constantly being analyzing, imagining, but also speculating and dreaming about uh, what we um, sort of uh, call it uh, an alternative interface to unravel and demystify our perception of truth. So I've had the opportunity to introduce my uh, background uh, on feminist hacking and especially has a strategy and uh, methodology. And this um, served uh, as an entry point to enable us to position ourselves uh, critically towards the, this challenge um, of searching the truth. So this persp perspective revealed how social change is a result of the human desire to pursue the so-called truth. So we asked our ourselves, which truth are we seeking to unravel? Can a true conceptual of, of reality be established in the current day? And how does it influence us as individuals and as collective? So is our truth an individual perception or a common belief constructed by the masses? So which personal tools or senses do we resort to in order to distinguish truth from falsity? And ultimately, can technology be an asset in the pursuit and repair of truth, even if in, uh, let's say, in a fictional scenario? So the diverse works we are presenting here today, which are working, uh, so works in progress on how truth is perceived differently with distinct uh, contexts and points of view. A common theme that arises uh, is the wish to unravel the truth in solidarity and by enveloping otherness, whether that is uh, through this self other or collective other. So I would say that half of the projects we're gonna um, have the opportunity to know more today, uh, focus on a very individual perspective uh, of uh, what truth can be. And we have other half that are uh, focusing on a more collective perspective. So the um, new media forms that are, are embedded in these diverse artistic projects were selected intentionally by the artists with deep community-driven awareness. So recognizing the impact of the uh, uh, proliferation of technology on human and non-human lives and bodies. In Search of Truth expresses a collective concern towards an excessive trust, dependency and reliance on new technologies in the digital age by tackling some of its troubles. So what we were constantly sort of questioning has a trouble. Uh, and those are in these projects uh, as an example, a digital self or the artificial intelligence problem trouble. And for instance, the mobile, mobile tracking trouble 
or on the other hand, by speculating on true um, presence and also true futures. So together we confirm this impossibility of a singular reality and with that, the urgency to constantly being resituating oneself, or in this case, ourselves, and becoming aware of the other side of the truth. So with that said, um, and without spoiling too much what the projects um, introduced here uh, will be about, I would like to um, start uh, with the presentations from the amazing participant, uh, participants we have here today. Now, and I would uh, like- Briefly just to introduce the panelists before we, we start with, uh, mm -hmm. with the presentations, but absolutely, let's, let's jump right in. So I'll just very briefly um, start inviting a few folks on screen, um, the panelists first, and then the artists, you're welcome to, to join us as well. Um, as you present. So uh, first we have Vanessa Chang, who I mentioned a moment ago, um, was a juror for the selection of the lead artists for this exchange, as well as someone who's followed, followed the exchange along and is now kindly serving as a panelist today. Um, Vanessa holds a PhD in modern thought and literature from Stanford University, um, where she researched uh, electronic gesture across the arts. Um, she writes, organizes, curates, and teaches new and old media, um, cultural histories, philosophies of technology, design, disability, cities, literature, comics, animation, sound, circus, and so much more. Um, uh, currently acting as the senior program manager at Leonardo um, and is also lecturing uh, in visual critical studies at California College of the Arts. Welcome, Vanessa. Um, the second panelist we have with us today is Rashin Fahandej. Also mentioned a moment ago um, was the exchange, the lead exchange artist to Austria for the exchange we um, ran there two years ago, American Arts Incubator Austria. Um, Rasheen is an Iranian American multimedia artist, um, independent filmmaker, um, and assistant professor of emerging and interactive media at Emerson College on the East Coast. Um, her projects center on marginalized voices and the role of media technology and public collaboration in generating social change, very much aligned with the work we do. Um, and this language I, I really find strong in, in the way that Rushing describes her work. Um, she's a proponent of art as ecosystem and defines her projects as poetic, a poetic cyber movement for social justice, um, where art mobilizes a plethora of voices. Um, by creating connections between public places and virtual spaces. So welcome, Rasheen. Um, and then finally, uh, we have Dasha Ortenberg also with us uh, as a panelist. Dasha is also a past lead artist on an exchange to Morocco we, we ran a few years ago. Um, Dasha is, is passionate about working with complexity. She enjoys finding nuance in apparently simple uh, arguments and reconciling uh, apparently contradictory questions. I think you'll, you'll likely see this in, in her comments today. Um, she holds degrees in art history and linguistics from Berkeley and architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design and is currently a 3D senior 3D designer at the Exploratorium. Um, so for those of you in San Francisco, you'll know what a creative role that is. Um, so welcome to all the panelists and a reminder that for all of you, um, the types of feedback we're looking to provide the artists today are things um, in these four categories. Um, one would be refinement. Um, the second would be aesthetics. Uh, the third would be stakeholder suggestions, people who might connect with or support this work. And the fourth would be opportunities for funding, resources, um, further education. So um, just an encouragement to to offer thoughts on the in those areas. Um, all right, I'll pass it back to you, Patricia, and uh, welcome uh, the artists on as they come. Thank you. And maybe also, uh, Shamsher, I ask you again to just keep an eye on, on, on the time. So we have, unfortunately, a very strict uh, schedule today, and um, each participant has five minutes uh, for presentation and then uh, followed by seven minutes feedback. So we will try to um, make this uh, very difficult effort to grasp the whole complex information behind the projects uh, from the artists in five minutes. Wow. So um, 
I would like to start first with a project uh, called Self Investigations, uh, hashtag zero, so uh, zero version uh, from Sharmi Basu. And I would invite now Sharmi to come on screen. And with no further delay, I would invite you to um, share with us uh, your project. Um, do I have sharing privileges? Oh, yes. Okay, let's do that. Um, what, what do you mean? Sorry, it's asking me to authorize all this stuff. So I'm like, uh, it's telling me I have to leave the meeting and come back in order to share my screen for some reason so okay so maybe uh since we are having a little uh, problem i would ask parul if uh you don't mind to come to be the next if you are around is that okay ah Charmi managed oh i did it it worked it, did. it worked we can okay. see your screen oh yay Happy, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so my project is called uh, Self-Investigation Zero. Um, I'm calling it zero because it is the kind of, well, one, zero, one, little um, cute pun there, but um, uh, number zero because it's actually a part of a larger series of interviews that I'm doing. So as you can see um, on this first slide, there's a few um, different aspects of this project. There um, is, um, a little teddy bear with um, some LEDs coming out of it, a person holding this teddy bear, and a video with a plant. The LEDs are in the plant. Um, oops. Ah. Um, so this pro project is asking collective questions um, about our individual relationships with conflict. So it is a collective question, but they're used, they're, we're using individual case studies to to investigate these questions. So um, there's multiple layers of it. How do users respond to conflict consciously? So we um, investigate that through asking questions somatically. Um, the, the questions are also asking the user to um, talk about how they feel in their body as they're, ask, as they're answering these things about conflict. Um, and then subconsciously, that's where um, the project that I'm I have done in, over the past couple of weeks um, comes into play. Um, and again, this is based off of a previous iteration um, with uh, just interviews. And uh, the screenshot on the left um, is me asking these questions, asking a series of 50 questions, again, about conflict, um, joy, trust, um, harm, and hurt and the body reactions to that. And um, uh, this little image down here is, um, is the previous iterations, which, were, uh, which was me just interviewing um, a number of different people, but like 10, I think 10 uh, different folks who of various gender identities, um, uh, who kind of identify as being part of like this like subversive community. Um, so the levels of testing that I feel like I've been trying to investigate with this are, um, so the video asks the questions, the user can observe this bear, um, and then the user chooses to, can either choose to answer the questions or not. Um, and so the questions, um, I put some, um, examples, uh, on the, on the right here, um, but the, the questions essentially um, are attempting to ask, to, to uncover these things, uh, or, you know, this, co this community that I'm a part of that's like very queer, very subversive, um, has to deal with a lot of trauma. And what I've found often is that uh, dealing with conflict is something that we are not necessarily like highly skilled at. And so that's where these questions are coming from. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a little, sorry, I'm a little bit all over the place trying to keep this to five minutes. I'm gonna show you like a little example of what's happening. So here in this video, you can see 
Um, there's the user watching the video, um, which is which is asking the questions. The user is holding this bear, um, and then there uh, the LEDs are in this in in this light situation. So let me see if I can. Just... Okay, so so you can see when the person is um, kind of holding the bear in certain ways, the colors of the light changes. Um, and then here's like another example of them just kind of, um, of them just observing the video and then the colors kind of staying stagnant. Um, so yeah, th this project, we hope to ground individuals in the body and explore how queer and subversive communities deal with conflict. Um, and then something I do with this project that's different than I did before is really try to um, uh, make sure that the questions that are being asked are also um, done with, um, I don't know, like a level of delicacy or something. Um, so offering these deep breaths happened before, but also encouraging folks not to answer the questions in the most like intense dramatic way, you know, like we think of harm and we can think of like the most horrible thing that's happened to us, but thinking about maybe like, oh, bumping into someone on the street is like a hurt, you know, or forgetting someone's birthday is like a hurt, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, my hope again is trying to rethink accountability, compassion, conflict, da da da. Um, and so the controller itself um, is an accelerometer that's coming out um, of this bear's little bum, and it responds to slight movement and it's scaled to shift when being hugged. So there's multiple, there's three accesses that uh, of data that are being kind of interpreted by the Arduino. Um, there's the X, Y, and Z access, and I've scaled them in a way based on like positionality. So the positionality of the bear actually really matters too. So, but that is- Charmy, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's just like the last sentence okay, that you have okay, a fair yeah. five minute to everybody. Yeah, but I think, okay. So um, I have this video available on YouTube, but uh, the main thing with the bear is I think it provides this, like it has all these different functions of, of, of encouraging the truth where it provides comfort for the user. It provides a layer of familiarity, intimacy, da 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 da. Um, and then it also indicates when there's activation in the user, right? So that this person who's like maybe watching the video and then is like, oh, I hate this question, hugging the bear, or oh, this question's not that bad, also hugging the bear. But in the light changing indicates that something is being activated in the user. So we are also, you know, if they're answering this question, then we kind of know. Um, you know, they might be like, oh, yeah, I'm a great, I deal with conflict great, but like hugging the bear really tightly, that tells us something about their truth, you know? Um, yeah, so this is my next step slide. I'll <laughs> end there because five minutes is whoosh. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> wow, great. So I think we have like five minutes left for uh, questions and um I would invite now maybe um, the panelists, our guests, guest artists to comments, questions. Um, I can start. Thank you, Charmi, for that. Um, it's a really intriguing project. And I think that um, your investigation of truth as being grounded in the body is a really provocative one. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about this notion of scale here and what, what it is that you do with the information that you're mapping from these X, Y, and Z axes and the accelerometer. You know, is it really, um, there's this feedback loop that you're trying to create between this bear and the, and the, the person holding the bear, but it's also a kind of means of gaining information. So what does that what do you do with that information in this project? Um, and, you know, perhaps this is a kind of provocative question. You know, there's, there's a kind of surveillance, embodied surveillance element there. Like how does the datafication of an embodied somatic experience um, inform the larger questions in your project? 
Yeah. Um, okay, multiple questions there. I feel like um, I haven't, I guess I haven't thought that far in terms of what I will do with the data itself, but I think my goal, so the other thing I should mention about this is that um, the questions are also going to are gonna be a zine um, that are gonna be distributed fairly soon. Um, so they, they will function on their own as well. Um, my, I think my intention with getting the actual, I don't, I'm not necessarily going to be keeping track of the data itself. That's like, oh, these people, other than like to fine tune the interaction between the bear and the colors. But what my goal, what, what I think would be useful would be probably actually like letting the user know what's happening, you know, um, because this is for the participant, essentially, like the whole project is for like accountability to me is like a collective process, you know, conflict is like, you know, can be very interpersonal, but also has like collective ramifications, you know, and so for me, it's really important, like, it, even just with that, they might be interacting without knowing what's happening. And maybe the like result of that is like getting a card or getting an email or like whatever that's like, hey, just so you know, this is the interaction that was happening, you know? Um, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I, I think open to ideas around that also. Um, and then what was your question about surveillance something? Oh, there's this interesting, um kind of translation, right, of this amorphous embodied experience into data that for me has a kind of resonance of, of surveillance. Like, so how do you, I mean, I don't know if that's a frame in your project, but um, the second that you do have something mapped onto particular kinds of axes, um, that framework kind of emerges. Is there a way that you are addressing that or mitigating that in some way in this project? Or is that framework of data something that you're really trying to kind of push against with this somatic interest? Yeah, I think that for me, like the data from the bear is so like one, you know, like the literal data, the literal numbers from like the accelerometer are so wackadoodle a lot of the time. So it's like really, for me, it's like kind of hard to like be like, hmm, you know, you went 29 to 31 and this means blah, blah, you know, or whatever to Z, like, yeah, that's not, I don't think that's necessarily um, useful for me. I do feel like for me, I, I've had a lot of questions myself about just because when I do the, the personal interviews, they're very, um, I cut up their faces, but I do want to add like a level of anonymity, but not have it completely anonymous because I want folks to be able to see the movements of their faces also as they're answering these questions. And the same goes for me, like asking the questions, you know? So I think, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I, I do wanna push against that. I don't know if I'm doing that explicitly, um, but you know, politically I do wanna push against it. If there is time. Uh, I would like to just offer one question. Thank you, Vanessa, for your um, for, for the question that you raised because I think that idea of surveillance and what we do with the technology and and the transparency of the participants knowing and and, and acknowledging that's really imp important part. Uh, I really um, enjoy the the visuals and aesthetic and also kind of thinking about staging of of. Uh, of a form of a staging as a as a as a way of engagement. The question that I had was in terms of, you know, especially considering um, that your target audience seems to be um, uh, considering the spaces of marginalized, um, and you mentioned queer and you mentioned agency and accountability. Uh, my question is that if um, how you're considering, because you, with your questions, you're already framing and creating a container for how this space could be explored. And I'm, and I'm wondering about the idea of engaging also the participant as a way of reframing the questions. And because the questions already, um, as I said, like create the container. Um, I don't know if you know about the, uh, the, the project Question Bridge that Kamal Sinclair and um, her collaborators created. And that's a very interesting model to consider 
that um, the audiences, for example, themselves have the agency to become the creator by asking questions and forming the questions for other participants. So that's sort of one format, but I'm, I'm coming back to this uh, space of agency and, um, and who is, you know, like in this spaces, the power dynamic between uh, these ways of creating together. So I'm going to stop there. Thank but you. thank you for, for the work. Thank you, Rasheen. I'm just going to hop in really quick with a process note, and this is for, for everyone. This is excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the back and forth. Um, and at the same time, I want to encourage the artists um, to receive the feedback that panelists are, are giving you questions, even when they're offering their questions. Um, and silently note them down for, for later. We'll try to get to some more discussion at the end if we have time, but uh, for now, I think it would be best in the interest of time um, to take note of the comments and then we'll move on. Thanks so much, Charmi. Um, and I'll pass it back to Patricia and welcome on the next artist. Thank you, Shamsher. Okay, great. So let's try to keep the five minute. Um, so our next artist, um, Parul uh, Vadwa. Uh, she's presenting a project which is actually a game. Maybe Parul, you could um, share in the chat the link for the game. And it's called Neil Stephenson's Metaverse. And I'll invite now uh, Parul to share your screen and share with us your project. Thank you, Patricia. And thanks everyone for being here and to Zero One for this amazing opportunity to collaborate and learn from Patricia and the rest of my peers as well. Um, today, during this exchange, um, I created a, a HTML game and I will dive into it right now just to explain to you what it is and then also what the game, uh, how the interface of the game works. So the name of my game is a Neil Metaphors, uh, Neil Stephenson's Metaverse, and it is a browser-based HTML game. The recommended browsers include Safari, Firefox, and Chrome, and I have not tested them on any mobile devices so far. Um, Neil, Metaphor, Neil, Metaf Neil Stephenson's Metaverse is an interactive non-fiction digital game. So way back in 92, Neil Stephenson, who is an author, is an American author, he coined the term metaverse in his novel called Snow Crash for um, some sort of a wireless online virtual reality experience that most of the tech companies, including Facebook, Google, and Samsung, are trying to monetize and commercialize right now. And when asked about coining the term metaverse in a recent interview with Vanity, Neil Stephenson said that he was just making shit up. So in the game, Neil, Meta, uh, Neil Stephenson is a character who comes across and um, guides the players through an HTML generated personality quiz with branching narratives and multiple choice questions to understand themselves in this artificial uh, intelligent world and also in this reality of metaverse versus the universe. The choices that the players make allow Toyn, which is the open source tool that I've used to create the game, and Sugarcube to score the participants slash the players and assign them a specific personality, which may or may not be accurate or true. So the questions that I'm trying to deduce through this is that, is it possible to deduce a personality from a complex human form in the metaverse? And then towards the end of the game, the goal for the player is to meet their specific digital self that Neil Stephenson as a character in the game has chosen for them and guide them towards specific questions or to help them think through things like, what is the purpose of technology? What is the metaverse? What is the universe? What is the truth of the metaverse? And if the purpose of technology is to elevate the human consciousness, then what awareness is the metaverse creating? And what is the purpose of human life? And who is human in an artificial intelligent world? So before I give you, um, you know, just a little bit of snippet into the game, I am also going to be sharing the interface of the game itself, uh, which I've created through Twine and Sugarcube. I believe you can see my screen. Um, so this is how the interface works. You can see a bunch of questions which get into branching narratives. 
and uh, you as a participant answer each of the questions that lead to the next question and of course back to the introduction of where it came from and the question of truth that it's investigating. The player goes to about 10 questions um, answering agree, disagree, um, don't disagree, um, all those kind of things. And then towards the end of the 10th question, they come across um, the narrative about what the game is trying to tell them or provoke those questions. At that point of time, they are provoked into answering questions about avatar being a human or a black box. And then they go through another three questions and all these branching narratives again connect to the introduction um, towards the end of which they are able to um, discover who they are in the meta world. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to play this through Twine. This is what the, the game looks like currently in the HTML format. Um, you can read about Neil, meta, uh, Neil Stephenson here and how he coined the word um, through his novel, what it's doing through artificial intelligence and machine learning. So whatever you do will connect you back to the introduction. And then you can start the game and choose whatever you need to choose as questions, whether you uh, contemplate the reasons of human existence or you think you're unique and you can answer a set of questions um, to reach your reality in the metaverse. And I'm just doing this for you and I highly encourage you all to check this out on the exhibition website. The link is provided there and towards the end of it, you can find your digital self by clicking here. For some reason, when I'm sharing the screen, it's not picking up the images, but it should. And that's the end of it. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I welcome uh, feedback from you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paru. Um, I guess uh, we can, uh, we need some uh, more than five minutes to play your game. <laughs> And I invite everybody yes. to do it afterwards whenever you have the chance. And now I would just um, invite Dasha to jump in and uh, for comments, questions. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Thank you, Perl. Well, that's a fascinating game and really um, kind of gets at the core of, of um, these kinds of pursuit of self um, and understanding of self that's a kind of quasi like metaphysical um, thing that 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 is at the core of uh, religion and and any other cu cultural constructs we can think of and um, and I think that this idea of the personality test is also really fascinating. Um, it's something that even before the metaverse was part of corporate culture um, in in a way, and it's also something that's part of review processes in corporate culture, and so. I think there's something super strange about it because it um, this kind of kind of allocation of letters or numbers to people's identities uh, results in this perception that you might be a singular thing that you are that thing when really in some ways it's a moment in time or the way that people choose to answer questions in those moments of time or in those contexts um, and there's this whole industry you know, of self-help and personality set, like allocations that's built up around this. Um, and so I wonder in terms of refinement and next steps for you, if you might want to study some of those, um, some, or if you already have studied uh, some of those uh, kind of standard personality tests and then everything, you know, ranging from, you know, uh, the, um, the books that are like, uh, about constructive um, collaboration um, to to things like which Harry Potter character are you and and how which tests are people drawn to um, and how does that help them um, how does that help them be more comfortable with defining their identities um, and I I also um, one of my backgrounds one of my uh, educational experiences was in linguistics and there is this. I think that I hear people say sometimes about you are, that's just the way someone is. Um, and that idea that being is permanent um, versus changing is something that's, that also just feels really embedded in these tests. And so I wonder um, when you're thinking about this in relationship to, to things like Facebook, which may make it harder to, <clears throat> 
to change who you are because who you are has been recorded for so long. Um, the, you know, how, how in the metaverse is change possible and is um, revitalization of some of an individual possible um, or vice versa? So um, I, I think there's a lot of fascinating questions here and I think you have a lot of research that can make this game really rich. Um, so thanks so much for that. Thanks, that was very useful. Thank you, Dasha. Thank you. Um, maybe we have just one, two mi more minutes left uh, for another comment. Um, I don't know, um, Hashin, Vanessa, do you want to add something really quickly? Yeah, I could add something. And bu maybe building on Dasha's comment, one of the, um, I certainly saw the resonance um, with personality tests in this brunching narrative, but also with um, choose your own adventure um, stories that I think are kind of really central to hypertext and the theorization of hypertext. And so perhaps this might be the space for exploring those possibilities as you kind of design those questions and that narratives like linguistically as you kind of explore hypertext maybe as poetry and this could be an avenue for research like hypertextual fiction um, and the kind of poetic force of code and of these kinds of stagings like how can you break open those expectations around what Dasha identifies as um, what are fundamentally kind of corporate constructs now that are kind of like language machines. So as as you unfold that language machine alongside these um, algorithmic machines, like what is it that you can do to really kind of split that open? Thanks, Vanessa. Hey, thank you so much, Dash and Vanessa, and a lot of um, very interesting ideas, I guess. I also have some thoughts maybe we could um, share in the end. But uh, for uh, the sake of time, I would uh, um, continue and would like to present the next artist. And Avital Meshi uh, is uh, presenting today um, performance, uh, let's say it was a very interesting uh, technological device that is, uh, was in this time used in a Zoom performance that she had the opportunity uh, to do with some of the participants here uh, present also with us. So uh, Structures of Emotion, Avital, I invite you to share with us. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here and thank you for the generous attention and time throughout this exchange was a really wonderful experience. I'll share my screen um, and present the project. So the project I'm presenting today is called Structures of Emotion. And it's a part of a larger examination in which I worked in collaboration with artist uh, Traden Chiara Valotti, um, in which we were examining uh, truth uh, around expressions of, of emotions and trying to understand um, people's emotions when we're looking at them. So when we come to think of emotions, there is a, an, an attempt to translate feelings into words and there is a sort of a structure to it. So basically we have a few primary emotions and then we can open this structure up into more nuanced emotions as we go along. Um, taking inspiration from artist Martin Creed, who is talking about feelings and how difficult it is to translate feelings into words, um, Traden and I were really examining um, the attempt of trying to look at one another and trying to understand how the other person is feeling, trying to describe those feelings and really delving into the idea of translation of feelings into words. Um, and then we have uh, some technologies which assume to be able to solve this problem for us by looking at our facial expressions and trying to assume or classify emotions. These um, technologies are uh, becoming embedded in services and products that uh, we use on a daily basis and we don't even know when they are being 
looking at us or when they are there and how this information is being used. But um, this kind of technology is uh, under critique because um, you know it's easy to say that when someone is smiling doesn't necessarily mean that this person is um, happy. Um, so Treda and I built this um, wearable device that uses an off-the-shelf AI technology that we found on GitHub. And this technology is able to classify seven primary emotions that you can see the list of emotions right here. And then we started playing with this technology, um, trying to understand one Thank another. You. And this is like an initial experimentation with this device. You seem neutral. So, um, you seem fearful. Okay. Uh, we did some more explorations with this device, but for the purposes of this exchange, um, we developed this uh, intimate performance on Zoom in which we invited participants to join us in this meeting. And then we compared um, the machine classification with the human classification. So I was wearing the device and Traden was uh, just, I was the machine person and Traden was the human person. And both of us looked at participants and tried to estimate their, their emotions. I'll show you a little bit of that. Seem happy. You don't seem happy. <laughs> Seems <laughs> light hearted. I feel mostly identified with the neutral. Seem neutral. Yeah, so um, we had a few participants. Seem happy. You seem fearful. You seem focused. So for the sake of time, I'll stop here. I'll just say that the next step uh, for the exploration of these performances is to actually meet again with the people who participate and try to let them see their own faces and classify their own emotions in, in those uh, videos. Yeah, and I'll stop here. I'm happy to, to get your feedback. Thank you so much, Avital. Well, Hashim, Vanessa, Dasha, please. I can start with a quick, quick question comment. Um, this is really fascinating. Um, I wonder. I think when when there's three people on the screen, it's a little um, confusing what role each one is playing. So it might be helpful um, when you're doing a Zoom call to provide people with backgrounds that have their role labeled on them and that blank out all of the context, so that we can focus on just the expressions um, and read that and isolate that variable that you're really focused on. And I think in terms of the aesthetics of this presentation, that would be really helpful. Thank you, Dasha. Maybe a quick comment too. I think um, the g given the life that we are living in and the, and the, and the uh, use of the technology in, in communication uh, in itself, that how it sort of reduces um, that, the, that sense of expressions. It's very interesting for me that you use the Zoom uh, as a platform for, to, for this encounter. And it really sort of brings it back um, or, or this lens into the technology more so than uh, than the one, for example, that we are witnessing two people sitting in this space. So I thought that was very interesting, and I agree that like I'm quite interested in the in the sense of poetry in the, and the possibilities that it might be in this relationship and how you might um, 
uh, in a way um, choreograph the like uh, the dyna the dynamic uh, between these characters on the screen uh, as a way of envisioning um, you know the 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 uh, the the loss and gaps and the different translation for me it sort of like it opens up so many different beautiful ways uh, I think if you if you uh, start really exploring it as a poetic uh, um, um, tool uh, uh, of of um, highlighting all of these you know the connection and misconnections and and the reality actually like in the human life like right I think that's the beauty of it that in our human life, we don't, we don't, we don't make it, and uh, you know, we don't make we, our our perceptions are very much contained within our, our uh, lens, right? Uh, so I think like mirroring that with the with the um, technology is is sort of interesting. Like I I felt if for for me it creates this sort of infinity room that we that there is like so many ways that you could through the choreography of this space, you could uh, bring so many beautiful elements uh, out. So I'm so more, I'm sort of thinking, future thinking uh, for, for, for the project. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Such a fascinating comment. Thank you so much. Um, if there's time, I'll make a very quick comment. There's um, the history of facial recognition for feelings and affect is, is, is very, interesting insofar as it's grounded in research that tries to assume a universal expression of feelings and, you know, anthropological research that sought to sort of travel around the world and, and find some kind of universal continuity between expressions. So it seems like there's an opportunity insofar as you're using Zoom as a global platform to really kind of uh, play in that gap a little bit, right? Like how can you use this, this work and this global network to explore the uh, the potential and limitations of those ideas, um, I'm not sure what direction that will take, but it seems to me a kind of very promising um, research and artistic question that you might want to explore. Thank you. Yeah, Zoom is all over, so there is an opportunity there for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess now in our uh, schedule, we have a um, very brief five minute break. And afterwards we um, continue uh, with um, Jenny. And so I would say we meet um, like um, we have now 11, uh, three. So we meet around 11, uh, seven. I would say Shamshir, please interrupt me if I'm wrong. But I guess it's our schedule. Is that okay? See you back in 07.
Okay, welcome back. I can see already Jenny is with us. Thank you so much, Jenny. And um, yeah, so um, maybe I could also share as long as we, um, or has we uh, introduced the projects uh, where we can find the documentation and a little bit, let's say, of the information of the project in our um, virtual exhibition website. And yes, and um, I would maybe pass the microphone and the stage to Jenny Balisley with the project and our work pro in progress host bodies. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'm going to just dive into host bodies in search of our truth, hopefully. Um, I've currently been an artist for many decades and an advocate, a curator, writer, and instructor, and wear many hats. But I definitely want to um, dedicate this project to my grandfather who had passed away on September 28th. And in 2017, my father and I took him on a road trip to his birthplace, which is Alicha, which means Medicine Man in Choctaw and the Forest Heritage Center Museum arranged a interview with the Choctaw Nation there of Oklahoma. And this experience really framed and changed and altered my art practice in which I look at history, memory, and personal experience and how that can be recorded and documented. And so when applying for this residency and you know what does searching for the truth means, I'm a research nerd and I really like to try to understand how ideology is formed and how this winning at all costs and ignoring science and how we sacrifice citizens for political ideology and gain. And so this disorientation really became a thread in how these theories and perspectives are being developed. So when I looked into this host body's idea and this process, I really admired the other impact artists' um, resonance on the fact of how they can really come up with these clear concepts. And I sort of do this document dump of different types of research and throw it out there. And you can sort of see this process and it, it becomes organized chaos. And how does this concept then develop? So when I really was thinking about how this installation would come to be, it really came to becoming a video monitor, you know, projectors, sort of custom pet air tags and air tags and plexi Vodi box and these custom stickers. And it really started with um, many years ago, a Republican um, politician referring to women's bodies here as host bodies. And then on September 1st, we had the Texas Senate bill in, um, which is also known as the heartbeat, heartbeat bill became law banning abortion at six weeks. And not only is that disturbing, but the fact that it relies on private citizen enforcement through civil lawsuits, that really took it up to another level. And so I started to investigate sort of what Apple air tags are and that technology and the fact that that technology is it's somewhat affordable. You can buy four for $99 on Amazon and they are a tracking device that you know can help people find personal objects, pets, animals, you name it. And so with this concept, I had four individuals were mailed this sort of host body air tag to keep, send back, recycle, dismantle, destroy, discard, Whatever the participant wanted to do, for me, this personal autonomy is a private choice. And so the artwork's journey becomes documented um, through this multimedia installation, but I don't show where this started or where it ends. So protecting those boundaries and that privacy, even though we live in a world where when we walk out the door, we're in our house, everything we are tracked through metadata, you name it, everything we do. And so um, what else does this sort of look like in a, in a physical exhibit? And this is sort of a draft image of what this could look like. 
And so I would like these host bodies to be displayed, the returned ones in a custom pet air tag keychain because you know, sort of identity. And then it would be tracked in the exhibit live on the screen, the ones that are returned. And so as you can see, a common shipping labels with the phrase handle with care, fragile, thank you. I would like to repurpose those with an open voting box. And, and, and this was based on research I've done where um, United State ballots have unique numbers that can be tracked to a voter. And so in this box, only a few of the stickers would have host body on it, really to represent how special interests co-op um, choice and democracy for power. And so in hopes of the goal that viewers become the participants with the option to take a sticker or engage in democracy, whatever they would like to do. And so this is a draft um, video of really tracking the four um, test host bodies. And you can sort of see where I put the four onto one screen and at different times of the day and part of that travel and journey, they become documented. And so this serves a sample of here's one of the returned host bodies in the pet tag. This is the live tracking. And then you can see the clear voting box here. And then with the custom stickers. So where do I see this future project? Um, you know, I really hope with more time because this was just a month and it was pretty intense, a wonderful month, really to really document it from start to finish, where when, if the four come back, how that will look, expand this project nationally and internationally. Um, I found it quite disturbing and shocking that I was able to track these air tags. It's a different journey from start, you know, from start to finish. And, and why is that? I'd like to have like a, a live website interface and interaction, also provide participants advocacy resources and links and to develop strategies and how to encourage that civic participation. Also, I've started a draft document identifying corporate responsibility in action, like corporation responsibility on the products that you create, and also the corporations that have their headquarters in states that don't really consider um, some of the population to have the same rights. And so what does that look like, that responsibility in action? And finally, I'd like to just say thank you to Patricia, the Zero One team, Maya Shamsur, and also the panels today and the wonderful artists, Stephanie, Sharmi, Eric, Marley's, Avatel, and Parole. Well, thank you so much. Really great, Jenny. I'm sure there's a lot of comments and questions. So please go ahead, Dasha, Vanessa, Hashim, please. Whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I can start. This is a, a really interesting project insofar as it aligns that kind of um, language of women's bodies with these tracking tools that, I mean, we basically carry all the time. I mean, you talk about how you can track these air tags. We can, we can be tracked constantly. So I'm curious about how, um, you know, as you develop the project, you might explore and stage this tension between um, freedom and its uh, inscription within this kind of larger machine framework because you know you are tracking it all the time but at the same time you're kind of talking about movement and the sense of being able to do what you will with it so the the way you're kind of defining and contouring and working with this idea of what is what is freedom and what is a host uh, it starts to get really knotty and thorny as you get into this work. So, I'm, you know, as you get deeper, I'm just curious, like how, what are some ways you might, you might place tension on those terms? Because so much of this work that you're doing is also about work in language and kind of language as doing a kind of political work as well. Yeah, and I think you bring up a really important point and aspect and, and that's sort of like, 
language really becomes an important aspect in ideology and how when we look at the last political cycle, like what tidbits, what focus groups work and how to sort of relay um, a perspective to gain, you know, power and sort of, and I agree with you, like, how does that look like with freedom and also this technology? Because that sort of, to me, goes into a whole nother like thesis paper in a way, because do we have freedom right now? Because, you know, our phones are constantly tracking you. So I think, Vanessa, that's definitely more research and that I will be doing. <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, Jenny, for the great presentation. And um, I love how you start with so much complexity and then reduce it to something much more simple. Um, and I feel like you might continue to pursue um, simplicity um, in this. And um, I, th I think your presentation of, you know, it's super minimal and that I really appreciate that. Um, I wonder if you could be, um, and maybe you were, and I didn't catch this, more explicit about how who gets the tags to begin with, and then articulating each of their choices. If this is about women's bodies, maybe it's always women who receive it. Um, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe you create kind of a list of the variables that you input into who receives it, and then you can track how, you know, their choices and, and where, who, how the, you know, tag traveled from one place to the other based on some initial choice that you made about who gets it. Um, to begin with, um, and that kind of reduces the variables as well. Um, and um, and I'm not sure I quite followed the voting um, part of it and the those tag that part of the tag. And so um, it, it would be helpful if you were a little more um, if you clarified what what's going on there a little bit more. Thanks. Yeah, great questions. And so um, with each. What I did is I um, had one of the impact artists um, in, in this program, they were sent a, a air tag and then I selected three other mentors in my life, female mentors, women mentors. And in each package, um, I had like a letter and a return stamped envelope to each individual. So I might not get it back. I will get back. I got one back. You know, So there is that framework, but I agree with you. I definitely want to have even more more of like a set role, like in my mind, it was mentors or, you know, the participants, but what does that look like? And then the second question was about before my mind passed, oh, the um, stickers, right? So that participant, um, I had a great one-on-one -on -one discussion with Patricia and she had mentioned what could be a participatory element in this artwork. And I have used those stickers and other artworks that I've created. And for me, it's really that personal autonomy is something fragile that we handle with care, that that is our choice. And so that's sort of where I connected those things. But I agree with you. I'd like to connect that and develop that. And I think research and what those advocacy tools can be, adding that element to the project will really you know, tie that together. Okay, great. I think we we are out of, out of time for feedback now, Jenny. I apologize. Maybe we can leave the discussion to the end uh, for our uh, Q and, and A session. And now we have our final presentation already. Um, uh, the final project uh, is titled Post Industrial Ecology. And it's a collective project. So um, Stephanie, Eric, and Marlies. Uh, I invite you um, to share your cameras first. So um, maybe just a very short introduction that uh, the three participants or the three artists haven't really um, met before in the sense of like collaborating with each other. So it was really impressive to, to follow their development. And uh, I guess because it's also like a, a, a collective project, uh, you have a, a little bit more time to explain and share with us uh, your project. So it's also more than one object that you um, finalize for this uh, stage. So thank you so much. And please um, 
I had you the word. Awesome. Well, thank you, Patricia, and, and thank you, Zero One, for hosting us. Um, Stephanie, if you can uh, pull up the slides, Let's get it. Awesome. So, hello, uh, my name is Eric. I was working with Stephanie and Marlis uh, in the, this collaborative pro uh, project, uh, pursuing the truth in post industrial ecology and kind of seeing what are the hidden truths if we lived in a post industrial life. And a lot of the elements that we saw were. Uh, toxins in the soil as well as the photo remeditative uh, properties that we see in some plants to again absorb the toxins and remove it and try to get things back to a, a post-humankind uh, world so uh, kind of tackling those issues and having a nice contrast between natural and unnatural aspects that you'll see later in the design um, next slide please so before we really go into it i guess we do a brief uh, bio on our backgrounds because it is a multidisciplinary uh, project that kind of let, used all of our skills, which was uh, really exciting throughout these uh, four weeks. Um, it was hectic, but in all the good ways. <laughs> um, so, you know, Stephanie, if you want to. Yep. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, my name is Stephanie Andrews, and I'm an experienced designer and creative technologist interested in exploring economies of collectivity, care, and communication. My work generally seeks to respond to emergent issues with levity and sentimentality and primarily takes the form of flex kits, software tools, art games, tactile spaces, and participatory installations. Um, and I'm Eric Couturis. I'm an interdisciplinary designer and engineer with a background in mechanical engineering and rapid prototyping. A lot of my research and focus, um, research focuses on the lifespan of consumer electronics and finding alternative uses uh, for coast consumer products. Um, key elements are user repair, modification, and disassembly of our products. Yeah, and I'm Marlis Mandeville, and I am someone that works across painting, sculpture, sound, and video to create immersive worlds that act basically as accessible spaces for uh, conversation and community and to push forward community needs and goals. Um, and I often use a, a poppy and, and humorous approach to help create those accessible spaces. Um, so after our first few sessions as a cohort together, um, Eric, Marlis, and I identified a common thread among our practices that led to our collaboration. We each enjoy creating tangible, interactive, and accessible work. And so for this exchange in pursuit of truth, we wanted to create something speculative, collective, and community, community oriented. We wanted to create something that can exist outside of traditional art spaces that is made with found and forged materials that subvert traditional pathways of creation and consumption in both art and electronics, and that grows and envisions collective truth and awareness around the future of electronics in a post-industrial world. Um, this all led to the first prototype of our installation titled Post-Industrial Ecology. This project is a speculative piece that confronts the challenge of foraging and farming in an industrial environment. So from toxic chemicals in our soil to human-made trash being dumped rather than recycled, the search for truth here is an investigation of the emerging generative capabilities of phytoremediative plants of natural ecologies and of post-consumer materials. This project chooses to accept the intermingling of natural and human-made objects and ask users if there can be a bright future where the two can cohabitate. And this project will take visitors on a post-industrial journey where they are asked to write their thoughts on post-industrial farming and foraging using a notebook and ink set created from foraged plant-based materials. To incorporate the unnatural human-made elements of post-industrial life, the notebook is embedded with two sets of electrical contacts that are connected to an Arduino Uno that is housed inside of a microwave that has been converted into a planter for phytoremediative plants. One contact set, when connected, will turn on the planter grow light, and the other will briefly turn on the built-in planter irrigation system. Visitors can bridge these contacts using the ink sets, which have conductive graphite powder embedded in the mixture, and they're invited to log this act of care in the log for others to reference. As the visitor moves throughout the project from writing in the notebook to interacting with the microwave planter, they are provided with QR codes for a link tree site containing papers and articles on bioremediation, phytomining, urban gardening, and micro mitigation tactics. This installation provides a glimpse of new and emerging methods for production, extraction, consumption, and regeneration. And uh, this is a installation diagram that's kind of encapsulating what Stephanie uh, has gone over. So kind of breaking it down to the mediums that are being used uh, from the conductive ink uh, to the paper that eventually uh, completes a circuit with the Arduino Uno that could either uh, light up a, a grow light or actuate a solenoid valve that will 
uh, find a way of benefiting the, um, the phyto remediative uh, plant that's in the planter. Uh, this is also going to be a way of how we're going to be organizing the uh, slides as we're moving forward, starting from the conductive being moving on to the, the planter. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the main thing that I tackled within this project was ink making, um, which, you know, I basically had two goals when, when coming into the ink making, which was to create ink that was conductive, if possible, using uh, extracting metals from photo, photo remediative plants um, and, and using them in the ink. Um, and then additionally to make ink of varying colors, because we want this project to be accessible to kids too. Um, and using a, a colorful approach is, is definitely a way to do that. Um, so I went out and I foraged in the park, in the neighborhood, in my backyard, and I basically brought back a bunch of materials into my kitchen, and I was boiling <laughs> stuff in my kitchen for a whole week um, using one part plant matter, two part water, um, a little bit of vinegar and a little bit of salt, and just kind of seeing what inks I could get. Um, and not all of it worked, but I did end up with eight inks. Um, I ended up with a hydrangea, a lichen, a nasturtium, an amaranth one with dried seed pods, kale, tree colored, and eucalyptus. So some of those plants are known for their phytoremediative uh, qualities as well. Um, and then of course, the next step was to add, uh, to, to add metals to make this ink conductive. So next slide. So we, oops, it's still playing. There we go. So um, we added uh, graphite. And, you know, we weighed it out to make sure we were getting the, the ratios uh, correct and, and kind of figuring out like how much graphite do we need to do this conductivity um, to complete our circuit and to actually make this work. And we're still in the process of figuring that out, um, but we were using an LED and a multimeter to kind of test where our voltage level was at. Um, uh, throughout that process. And we ended up with one conductive ink and seven inks that are colorful because we of course realized when we were adding the graphite that it would darken the inks um, and it, it made it more black. So currently we have one conductive ink and then the rest are for people to draw with in the journal. And next slide. Oops. Yeah. Yep. And so the next step was paper making, which uh, Steph and I did together. So next slide. So Steph went and foraged dry materials, and then we soaked those materials overnight. Um, and the next day we started boiling them. Next slide. And we boiled them with half of the plant matter that we had foraged and half recycled paper, which essentially makes it a little bit easier to make a pulp given our time frame. Um, we then pressed the paper. So we have these nice seven by nine inch squares. So, you know, for scale. And as we took our pieces of paper out, we were pressing wildflower seeds into the bottom right corner of each page. Um, and we made a couple different iterations with, with different colors of paper. Next slide. And part of that process was fine tuning it to really get a sense for uh, how much plant matter we needed, how much it had to be blended, because of course this affects the, the resistance uh, quality of the paper in terms of how conductive the ink actually is. So this, that was something that we were testing as well as we were going through these different iterations of paper. Next slide. And um, just this is just a little video to show you what our care log ended up looking like. So um, I bound this book and essentially we have the log on the front so that when uh, participants come and they, they draw a line completing our circuit and they interact with the journal and they write in it, um, they can also log the date, the time and how they cared for the plant. And of course they can end their interaction with this particular object by tearing off the bottom right corner of the seeds and taking that home and um, planting our own plant. Next slide. Um, and so to kind of all uh, put everything together uh, to house the, uh, the, the phyto uh, remediated plants, um, we were trying to find ways of reusing uh, industrial, uh, industrial objects um, as this kind of con way of contrasting things. Um, with a post-industrial ecology, we still see echoes of our industrial past selves. And so I've been trying to encapsulate the idea that uh, human-made waste is this unnatural natural resource that we can still gather, unfortunately. So this was found at a waste dump uh, down in San Jose, uh, trying to find ways of encapsulating all elements of the microwave without putting in anything new uh, into the environment. So here's me just trying to modify the microwave a bit so that we can have a nice flow of water and having a graded under underside. Uh, next slide, please. And 
trying to find a way of uh, not only encapsulating the physicality of, 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 of industrial waste, but also the visual aspect of it, this kind of like outlandish look. So I try to include this uh, really bright pink to, to, to overemphasize the point. Uh, I think there's an animation after that if you click it. Uh, in addition, this, this also is uh, reactive to black light. Uh, so there's all that, that kind of further encapsulating that visuality of things. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the other benefits is that with this microwave valve, we have the cavity to kind of cleanly house the, the Arduino and all the, uh, the reactive elements of this planter. So that includes the glow, uh, grow light as well as the uh, solenoid valve that controls the, the water flow. Uh, one of the elements that we're trying to move on is seeing how by incorporating uh, relays, we can uh, quickly modify the planter based on the needs. So we can either swap out a grow light, swap out a solenoid valve. So there's a lot of potential and growth that we're moving forward to, uh, which I think kind of cleanly goes into our next slide, um, which it goes into, oh, and then kind of the overall uh, layout that we currently have when we were showcasing it at zero one. Um, oh, I guess we should probably kind of wrap up. So this kind of gets into future work. Um, so, uh, Stephanie or Mar Marlis, do you want to jump in or, <laughs> or is it? Also leave the, leave this slide up for y'all to read, um, since we are into our feedback time. Oh, yeah. okay. Perfect. But that's, um, that pretty much wraps things up. <laughs> Maybe a final sentence. Uh, Marlis, do you want to add something? Uh, sure. Um, it, I mean, I think, you know, as we move forward, the three things that we're focusing on are troubleshooting and fine tuning this actual physical prototype. And our goal is to get it out there as soon as possible. So we can do basically do a trial run, we're looking at alternative spaces, we really want to see if we can do something outdoors um, during a time and a place that's accessible to kids. Um, and then, you know, in the future, after we kind of do that trial run and get that community feedback, we're looking at different ways to uh, expand upon the project. So yeah, it's been really exciting to, to work with this group so far. Yeah, and one of the things I um, would also want to add is, is trying to find ways of, of really showcasing the impact. So we're hoping to get uh, uh, toxic soil that can showcase the plant, but the photo remediative plant removing the toxins over time, so having a nice compare and contrast and showing that every little bit of impact kind of builds into a, a, a greener future. Um, but yeah, it's future work. <laughs> then, and thank you. Thank you so much. So again, I invite our guest artists to jump in for feedback or questions. Maybe I'll start. Uh, thank you, everyone. This was very beautiful presentation. And I uh, enjoyed so much that how much you brought the processes into this space because the work is about the process uh, and, and then sort of having these tangible uh, outcomes but at the same time representing that process. And with that, I was thinking about how, you know, you, you mentioned the target audience uh, being multi-generational or at least like um, thinking about children and the next, you know, uh, generation. Uh, in terms of expansion and the next phase, I'm also wondering about ways that the, the, the project could exist outside of you as an artist. and. Uh, how it could be um, expanded in the ways that, for example, thinking about different blue, like blueprints, it's not a good I, good um, uh, word for it, but ways that this project could exist. You know, for example, I'm thinking about the the example of that is is varied, but for example, in art space, Yuko Ono's more poetic, but like instructional uh, arts, right? Or if you think about even the the uh, question bridge that I mentioned. It is a transmedia project uh, and it is participatory, but at the same time, there are forms of, um, the, there are pedagogy around it, modules that it could be represented by, by themselves. And then it, the, the instructions could be followed as, as a way of um, having multitudes of being sort of learn how to adopt into this sort of post-industrial um, sort of processes and, and approach. And, uh, and I really enjoyed also the, the sort of re, um, reclaiming uh, because in our reality, like we are beyond the point that we say, okay, we can protect things or we could stop things, right? Like 
things are already too bad. <laughs> so, and then how to find processes to reverse this uh, mentally, so, you know, philosophically, but also in reality and within processes is very interesting. And I think um, sort of that acknowledgement that these facts, we already sort of uh, created a lot of um, like impact that like how, how again, like another very good aspect that I'm wondering how these could be highlighted in the in your work or the presentation of work and the aesthetic that you're bringing forward um, uh, is, is that sort of individual actions that it could be incremental, it could be small, but the accumulation of that collective uh, actions could, um, could, could create uh, the, the impact. I'll stop to pass it on to, but thank you for the work. We're playing a uh, tag team here. Um, yeah, just to build on uh, what Rasheen said, I think another uh, art reference might be um, Smithson's non-sites, where um, you think about how how does this um, apply to a specific place um, and how, when extracted, do these objects um, speak more abstractly? How does a map or the drawing or the note taking um, connect uh, connect specific locations, but abstractly to then the microwave um, and this kind of extraction of resources. Um, in terms of, um, I mean, I thought it was so fascinating, this kind of hermetic feedback loop that you create where, if I understood correctly, writing something or drawing something creates the the watering and the the kind of support and sustenance of the plant itself that can then generate the ink or the the paper be used to generate the ink or the paper so that hermetic feedback loop was really fascinating and i wonder if what would happen if you would think about scaling it to an urban scale um, and this is coming from kind of this architecture and urban planning background like what would happen if you took uh the this kind of ink and connectivity um, and conduction to a scale where someone's doing this in, in a city or at the scale of an entire um, an entire refuse heap or something like that you know how what what happens then um, and so I think you could have speculative proposals that they are based on this prototype um, that could envision things like that. Yeah, um, echoing both Rasheen and Dasha and saying I love the regenerative impulse in this work. Um, it makes me, I, you're on the Bay Area, is that right? So um, I think you should think about being artists in residence at Recology. Are you familiar with that? Um, that works. So um, the work also makes me think of the artist, uh, maybe you're familiar with her, Alicia Escosh. Um, Alicia, I saw some of her work at a Recology exhibition. She's working. I mean, the artists there actually go into the rubbish pile and forage for materials. Um, and that could, I think, be a really interesting direction, you know, and when we're talking about scaling and the, the detritus of a city and what it might be to really engage with the detritus of different cities. Um, another kind of potential maybe for scaling is thinking about this kind of work in, I mean, I'm not sure what the space might be for this, but in community gardens, right? And kind of turning this, um, this recognition that we do live in this post-industrial landscape on its head. Like, okay, well, we can try to live in these old kinds of paradigms, but what might it mean to also place that this work in conversation with, um, with more traditional forms of farming and gardening? So that I think really um, place you in the community in really interesting ways. But, Really exciting project. I love the um, the artistic choices as well. The choices around kind of paint and aesthetics, the the craftness of it all, and the really kind of deep engagement that you have with the materials that you have. Um, really beautiful aspects of the project. Great. I, I'll um, I'll use this moment to uh, shift gears and kind of welcome everyone into the final phase of today's event. Um, thank you so much to all the artists for your presentations. I, uh, I'm loving so much how, how so many of your projects really take the body as a center 
a central place in the, the deciphering of truth, the understanding of truth, whether it's contrasting intellectual and somatic response, or giving, uh, getting at the truth of our body through a, an AI personality quiz, or through facial expressions, um, this sort of host body reversal of, uh, of, of how we think of our biological cells, and then finally this uh, transforming of the dirty truths in our environment through um, remediation. Really fascinating survey. Um, and I want to ask for everybody actually who's, who's already presented, panelists as well, to come off of mute. So join us on screen. And we'll spend the last 15 minutes um, just in more of an dis open discussion format. Um, I would welcome questions from artists to other artists, or if there's the things you want to follow up on that you didn't quite have time for in the feedback session, um, people can come off mute and, and chime in. And of course, for attendees, audience members, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat for us. Um, and we will, uh, I will be the one who can, who can pull them out of the chat and, and offer them to the group. Um, so yes, whoever is feeling like they have a burning thought or question on their mind, um, please jump in. I'd just like to respond to some of the comments from um, our, I, I think Rasheen had commented on um, instructionals and expansion about like how to, um, to branch out the impact that we have. Um, and actually that's something that we started with um, was talking about instructionals and that's something that like we're actively um, pursuing working on because a huge part of this was like, how can we convert this to have um, this project to have like, um, to be accessible to other people in a way that they can do it at home. Um, it's so much about a fighter remediation goes, takes place over the course of decades and you don't really have that impact until there's like a lot of, um, a lot of engagement um, over time. Wonderful. And on that, you know, Vanessa mentioned uh, the, the community gardens, but I feel like uh, this has so much potential to also think about community centers. Um, they all have some kind of initiative, um, like a schools also, because you're thinking about different different age group. Um, and there is a, uh, I have to look it up to remember the name of the project. I would recommend that you look at the recent um, um, project who won um, the um, starts uh, or um, starts prize uh, at at Ars Electronica, and they also had very interesting um, sort of larger scale um, project around this this uh, similar idea of uh, revitalizing and reusing and and that sort of idea of like looking into the future through that um i think um shamshir put the put the link in the chat and i think that would be um you know interesting to even connect with them they were an amazing group of uh women mostly uh who were working on this project i'll just maybe uh oh, sorry oh go ahead shamshir you, you, you have the mic in just a moment, but I was just going to echo a, a comment that was dropped into the chat from uh, Anne Contreras, who says that um, they really like the idea of scaling up the post-industrial ecology prototype, that there's such potential in that project. Go ahead. Um, I, I was actually going to make a comment about Jenny's project because I didn't have the chance, but I don't want to stop. If, if there are more comments on, on your project, we could also continue with that, and then I'll come back to that. Or should I go ahead? I'm going to go ahead then, <laughs> if there's silence. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much for your work. And uh, just two quick comments. Uh, one thing that I was wondering about visualizing the data, you know, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, and, and, and uh, I know Dasha also like kind of uh, mentioned that, but I'm like also wondering really about like the visual representation that is happening on the screen. And, um, and I thought it, it's really beautiful to consider movement in that because some of the images that you showed, they were aesthetic and, and how would be some of the ways that we could visually uh, be able to identify as an audience and, and the people who are not in the process 
uh, how that choice making and and that freedom and that and and also and also the surveillance, right? Because it's it's really kind of mixing the two that you are uh, surveilling and you're using this technology and the ethic of what does it mean to do that, but at the same time you are giving freedom on the choice and, and how is that visualized uh, for, for us or as, as, a, as a process rather than as aesthetic uh, moment. And then the other one you mentioned corporate responsibilities and advocacy, and that's also quite, quite interesting and important to sort of consider what is the, what is the next step and the connection um, with that. And I'm happy you know, like, uh, to, to talk later too, but I thought those, I wanted to uh, uplift those uh, elements. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think, um, you know, in researching how to really track it and visualize it, um, the Apple AirTags is not a desktop application. And so, um, you know, how you're manipulating that into art and sort of tracking it, but just how can you um, sort of make that movement because it really pings off the other iPhones around it. So it's not really a linear line that you see in movement. Really, when you see the movement of the AirTag, it is when it's with me, the primary host, the percher, <laughs> the person who purchased it. And so that's a weird element. And how can I revert that to the participant? So you do see some movement in between. So um, I appreciate you sort of bringing light to that that part of it, because that's definitely more research that I'll be doing. I'm seeing Marley's question too, to, you, to Jenny about um, whether you've read Octavia Butler's um, Blood Child. I don't know if Marley, you want to say anything else about the, the question or the thought? Oh, it's just, um, it's, it's such a, it's a very intense short story. So, prepare yourself if you read it, but it is a short story. Um, I recommend reading it. Uh, it's this sci-fi world in which uh, these two species kind of live in this, um, this uh, what's the word for it? Uh, they live together and, and essentially one hosts the other's um, young and eggs. It's very intense. Uh, but I recommend reading it. And I also just think with the term, and there are just like so many, um, yeah, there's so many like sci-fi connections. And I was also just thinking like, I like the simpleness of the aesthetics, but like going, I want, I just, I wonder also about like going in that more kind of like, how do, how can you connect that kind of like sci-fi stuff that's already out there? Um, and with kind of this, bringing it back to this very like present, way where you're talking about like the voting and the politics and and how how can you kind of make those eerie connections because it is i mean there's so much eerie stuff you're you're talking about where it is it's so surreal it's like how is this real you know and kind of i think you could play on that tension tension a little more even but i recommend reading reading the story there's also if i may add that that is it is a very powerful story um and it makes me think about how Jenny and the work that you're doing, you're kind of, you're creating an interesting alliance between um, women and pregnant women, pregnant people and these objects, right? These machines. And I'm kind of, you know, on one hand that could be read as an interpretation of, you know, the constant transformation in, of women and into objects, but also, what is the possibility of that alliance, right? If you're trying to kind of turn that on its head, is there a way to um, reclaim or rethink these tracking tools, these tags to um, in service of other kinds of political work? I, I don't have an answer, but it seems like there's a real possibility for how you might invert that. Yeah, that, that's, um, that also made me think of, um, in a way, uh, Charmy's project because you have these familiar objects um, and they represent something, um, some concepts like the tags represent a utilitarian concept in our world right now and you're taking it and make and making us think about them as a more kind of um, as a more kind of human metaphor for movement and tracking and um, and then in, in Charmy 
in your project, which I didn't get a chance to comment on, I, I was thinking about those two familiar objects, the plant and the, the teddy bear that you were using and how in a way they themselves are embedded with, um, with ideas about comfort and, um, and cultural kind of constructs of comfort. Um, and so, um, so in terms of thinking about uh, your, uh, the representation, and this is a little bit thinking across the board for, this is a theme I've observed in a number of the projects where um, there, there are these things that are familiar um, and we're using them in, um, in spaces that are either kind of, that, are, that isolate those objects. Um, and so I think further isolating them and really highlighting them um, in a way that, that puts that emphasis on them um, in your representation um, would, might be a next step. Um, and as you kind of advance your projects, um, you might think about what moves a project from prototype to presentation um, and which aspects of the prototyping you want to maintain and which of them you might reduce in, um, in kind of in the next phase. Great. Are there, are there other questions from panelists, things that you didn't get to, to squeeze into our shortened feedback um, periods? If there's anything else in your notes or things that came up for you, this, you're welcome to bring them up now as well. Maybe a quick one, a quick question for pa Parol. Um, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, I was wondering, you know, I love that the, 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 the you know, it, it's very, very strong to think about the language and uh, uh, as a way of con confronting self and this sort of digital self. And but I'm wondering, if I was just like questioning briefly, I might have missed something there about the accessibility and if there is any possibility of like broader audience rather than just like visual um, like text reading. And if you had any any any, any thought about that that interaction. Um, and then another part of that, I was also again thinking about I have to go through the I feel like I didn't get we didn't get enough information like visual sense maybe from the how the process would be but I'm definitely interested to go through it and see um, like investigate this sort of like um, self self um, um, sort of testing or, or or process that we are going through to see what other sort of visual elements might might be there um, I'll, I'll do with that Thanks, Rashin. Um, I really value that feedback. I've thought about it. I also, I also felt like the whole interface was very digital. So in case um, I wanted to make it accessible and because it is a satire on the whole idea of metaverse and that technology doesn't really lead us to our larger goals of consciousness um, or how it's doing so, I wanted to also create like a non-digital version of sort of like flipping that into a book or sort of a comic book where people can like choose um, the choices that they're looking at in the personality test and go back to the page. So, uh, you know, sort of like having a digital interface, but also having like a book in itself that you can uh, play through. So in that case, it becomes like a physical game, but also like a digital game in terms of um, making it accessible to people who do not have access to or do not want to have access to any sort of a digital interface. Um, so that's what I was thinking of in terms of next steps and aesthetics. Um, um, I'm not really sure because the tool that I used is um, the default format looks pretty much like a hyper language text, but there's so much that I can do with it in terms of taking this game into the metaverse itself and experimenting with tools like AR and VR um, and creating this game within that context as well. So I'm interested to experiment um, there as well and see how this uh, game might shape up uh, in the metaverse itself. We have time for maybe one more question if someone has something they'd like to bring to the group. Yeah, I just would have a question for Avital. Um, I was a participant in your project and I really loved how it forced the participant to work outside of their routine. Like you really force them to stay, stay in one spot, focus. <laughs> and that to me was like very difficult, but I am curious, um, 
have you have, do you have another element to the project where it records the participants reaction because i i don't think i'm alone in feeling that way and, and i'm sure it's fascinating even your insights i would love to know your insights of the participants you worked with um thank you for the question jenny and thank you so much for participating it was a pleasure to have you there and i think your participation in particular was such an amazing experience for both me and Trayden because you were so joyful and sweet and you, co you continuously expressed your you know, difficulty to sit still, though we didn't ask you to sit still, but, but we tried to be, like especially me wearing the machine, I tried to be this very, you know, non-person like very cyborg but with you it was almost impossible because it, you know we kept bursting into those laughter moments in which you know it was such a was such a joy but definitely i feel like you know as as the the one wearing the device obviously i had my own human uh perceptions of how you felt or other participants felt and there was this tension between what the machine says and what the human says and how you felt. So some of the participants gave us input, like what you saw in the video that they identify with this feeling or another. And then we did do a reiteration with some of the participants. And when they looked at themselves, they were like struggling to find the words of how they felt in this um, experience. So. Eventually, they a lot of them were like going into those primary emotions again. They were like, "Oh, I seem happy. I, I seem happy," you know. So it's really difficult to kind of like really take those feelings and translate them into something that everyone can agree on or understand. Um, I guess I might be curious for for each of the artists to to hear, maybe not right now, but um, as you refine your projects, an articulation of how in your project there is a slippage between represented truth um, and perceived truth or or what one believes to be true versus one, what one's reading as true through the, the artwork. Um, and, and so I thought that was a really, it was, you know, really interesting and across the board that there's this slippage in the technological representation of the truth versus what one might actually be experiencing or creating. That's a nice thought to leave, leave us with. Um, thank you, Dasha. Um, I think we're, we've just run out of time, so I, I, I think I'll call it there and also um, release you all into the rest of your day or into your evening. Um, thank you so much for, for putting all this work together in the month that has led up to today and then sharing so concisely all of this creativity. It's really been a joy to hold the container for, for this exchange. Um, I hope uh, you all consider yourselves part of the Zero One family and um, will we'll stay in, in touch with us. Um, thank you so much to Patricia for, for leading the charge. Um, this really is uh, because of your inspiration and, and your leadership um, that, that we've arrived where we've arrived. Um, I also want to thank a couple characters who've been operating in the background, um, Paul Olet and, and Maya Hilbert. Paul uh, did a, a lot of the documentation, some photography, some video that you'll see on the site. I'll drop the link one more time into the virtual exhibition site. Um, which was designed by the very talented um, and incredibly fast Maya Hilbert, who's able to whip up these online presentations for us, has worked with us before, and, and again, um, put her brilliance to the test uh, with this site. So thank you everyone for, for all of that. I'm going to also um, drop, I think, a set of links to our partners on the project, who I want to thank one more time. Um, Here's a set of links to all the partners, Open Austria in particular here in, in San Francisco. Um, they do excellent work connecting uh, the Bay Area to Austria um, through the lens of commerce, also through the lens of art and science. So I encourage you to sign up for their events. Um, Ars Electronica, of course, in Austria, uh, a site that is, has long been lauded as a, a center for, for this kind of work. 
um, definitely encourage you to check out a lot of their work that's that's now happening online or in hybrid format. And uh, and then the Austrian uh, government for for being so kind as to to pay for this exchange um, and bring bring us a little closer together. So thank you everyone. Hope to see you IRL very soon, and uh, wishing you all the best with your creative work going forward. <laughs>